give it like 10 more seconds and then we'll launch in. Okay, um, <clears throat> so this talk I think is going to be a bit of a change of, change of pace for people. Um, a little bit different. I think, uh, for one thing, I am not a technologist. Uh, I got, embarrassingly enough, I think on the AP, uh, when I was in high school, the a chemistry AP, I mean, I got like fives on history and things like that. I got a one on the chemistry AP, which I think is about as good as a dog will do. So actually, I did about as well as my dog. Uh, would have done that. So I'm not, I'm not a technologist at all. I'm a lawyer um, and a law professor. So, which is bad news uh, because not only am I a lawyer, a damned lawyer, uh, but also I'm a law professor here at the law school. So I make more lawyers. Uh, so to bedevil you all, um, I've been a politician in my life at, at certain times, uh, which means that I could probably talk for a long, long time. So you might need to throw things at me if you start getting bored um, at all. Um, now, any lawyers in the, in the audience? Okay, all right, cool. So this is not going to be completely alien to some of you. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is, um, I'm not going to talk about sort of how we defend infrastructure or anything like that. I'm gonna, this is a more conceptual talk um, that I want to talk about and what was billed in, the, in your program was about the, the concept of balance uh, and balancing different competing priorities uh, in the context of security and infrastructure and technology and the use of big data. And which is really about, in my view, I think balancing four kind of different things. One is security and law and order, certainly. Um, two, uh, and I'll get into who I am in a second. Uh, this, is, this will lead into this. So one is, is balancing security and law and order. Another is balancing commerce and business models, like say Facebook's business model. We saw it took a hit uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, another is customer demand. What do, we, what do we want? What do we want from businesses? What do we want from a Facebook? Uh, and lastly, privacy and civil liberties. And how, it's the question is how do we balance all those things? And um, now, to my background. So I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm a partner at a law firm in town and around the country called Holland and Knight. Uh, I'm also, I teach uh, national security law uh, at USC, uh, the law school here. Uh, and in my background, so my background got a sudden shift when the balance of those four things got out of whack. So I was supposed to argue a case uh, in federal court in New York City. Uh, I was in the DC office of an, of an old law firm of mine, Gibson Dunn and Crutcher. And I flew up to LaGuardia Airport uh, at 8.35 in the morning, arriving at 8.35 in the morning on the morning of 9-11. Nine, nine so, uh, and I was on the Queensboro Bridge heading into Manhattan, and I saw, looked up from preparing for my oral argument, I saw smoke coming from the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And the rest of my day was 9-11 in New York City. So, cab snuck, you know, snuck down FDR Drive to get downtown Manhattan where the federal courthouse was about three blocks away from the World Trade Center we turned into downtown looked up and saw the South Tower was on fire so and the rest of the day was 9-11 two weeks later uh, through circumstances I don't even go into I was in the government uh, I had been yanked into the government and I was now head of policy for the border agency which at the time was US Customs and then when the Department of Homeland Security was created I was head of policy for US Customs and Border Protection um, dealing with everything from going from thinking about First Amendment law when I was at the law firm to suddenly thinking about radiation detection, sea containers, and eventually the Border Patrol, just like that. Um, at later on in my career, after a, another bout of law practice, which I got over at some point, but now I'm back. I don't know if the antibiotics for law practice, but um, uh, I was yanked into the Obama administration. So I served in the Obama administration. I was Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security uh, in charge of threat and security policy and then in charge of borders, immigration, and trade policy. So, and I mentioned the concept of balances because 9-11, arguably, is a story where the balance tipped too far away from thinking about security, in, at least in the context of terrorism. 
uh, and we put too many obstacles in the way of the CIA talking to the FBI, in, in the way of parts of the FBI talking to other parts of the FBI, and made it impossible essentially for us to unravel the 9-11 plot. We actually had the intel to actually be able to do so. In the big morass of data that existed in 2000, 2001, we had the information. The CIA knew about two of the hijackers uh, and didn't communicate that information with the FBI. So balance was out of whack on that side. Now, when I went into the Obama administration <coughs> in 2015, I was very conscious of that issue, uh, and, but about the concept of how the balance can go the, the wrong way. So before I went into government, uh, I thought, because you think about the, the years after the 9-11 attacks in the Bush administration, you had certainly the military and intelligence efforts against Al-Qaeda, but then you also had things like the warrantless wiretapping, uh, and you had Abu Ghraib, and you had the airboarding, and you had where the balance of security versus civil liberties and all that had gone kind of the other way. And so I was conscious of that. When I, before I went into the, the Obama administration, I um, thought, uh, I, I took a trip actually up the Eastern Sierras. Highly recommend Highway 395, an amazing road, one of the great roads of California. And I went to uh, Manzanar. Anybody ever been to Manzanar? Yeah, so what's Manzanar? Yeah, right, it's, it's, the, it's, one of the great, it's one of the sites of the Japanese internment during the Second World War, and there's an amazing museum uh, devoted to the history of the Japanese internment uh, in World War II at Manzanar. Uh, it's also in a beautiful but remote part of California. And I got, there's a great uh, Ansel Adams of a cemetery that's at, the, at Manzanar, uh, this iconic image of a sort of a obelisk that's in the cemetery that was built there during the war by the internees. And there's an uh, photo of it. And so when I went into the Obama administration, I took uh, a poster of that photo and put it up in my office in the administration. I put it right next to a picture I had been given when I left the Bush administration of the front of the US Customs Service that had been destroyed by the, nine, by the North Tower on 9-11. Took off the facade of the building, destroyed the building. Everybody was, nobody was killed, but it was uh, utterly destroyed. And I put them next to each other on the theory that when I was in that job, Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security, I need to look, think in terms of too much security gives us Manzanar and not enough security gives us 9-11. And so when you think about policy with regard to technology and big data and, and all of these issues and government policy, you need to think in terms of balances. No, there's no, there's, you're, and you're never going to have the right answer that's going to last for all time. So, um, that's what I want to talk about today, is, is this issue of technology. Here we are at a conference called Big Data Los Angeles, and thinking about infrastructure security. Um, but technology is, 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 is a, it's, a, it's a point of instability in terms of how we think about the right balances between security and privacy and consumer demand and business models. And technology forces us to rethink that balance with every technological advance. And with that, take us back. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about. Now, start throwing things at me if you want me to talk about something completely different. You want me to talk about the Russians and cybersecurity, or happy to talk about that too if you want me to. And hopefully, we'll build in some time at the end to talk about anything you want, anything you want me to. But this is what I want to talk about. So you're, you're stuck with me. Um, so, uh, but I want to take us back in time a little bit to uh, 90 years ago. So there was a case. Uh, it was an interesting case called Olmstead versus United States. Anybody ever heard of that case? 90 years ago, a little, yeah, yeah? What do you think? Okay. It's about wiretapping. It's about wiretapping. So this was a case, <coughs> it's a great case, 1928. So what was the big issue of the day in the 20s? Booze, prohibition. So a guy who was a, who was a cop in Seattle had a side job running, uh, being a, a bootleg liquor runner. And he was importing and exporting uh, booze in and out of British Columbia. And he was eventually, he was under, brought under suspicion um, uh, for violating the National Prohibition Act. And federal agents 
uh, of the ATF, um, wiretapped conversations coming out of his house and also the houses and offices of some of his, of his conspirators. Without a warrant, no warrant whatsoever, they just put a wiretap on all these communications, all the wires coming out. And the Supreme Court, interestingly, um, by a 5-4 decision, and the, and the majority, the, the opinion was written by Chief Justice William Howard Taft. Any, know, anybody know who William Howard Taft was in a previous life? President. president of the United States. He's the only Supreme Court justice uh, to have served as a prior president. I believe he's also the only person to have headed up two different of the U.S. government. So he was president uh, from 1909 to 1913, and then he became Supreme Court Chief Justice. Anyway, so um, Taft and the Supreme Court majority says, no problem. Government can do that. We don't need a warrant to wiretap anybody. Why do you think that was? Well, yeah, so telephones were 50 years old at the time. So that's a, that's a mind-blowing thought. Telephones were the new technology then. It's only 50 years old. But yes, it was new technology. But why was there no warrant required in Olmstead? Exactly. So basically, ta in view, privacy, at least under the Constitution, under the Fourth Amendment, privacy was about trespass. It was about government can't enter your house, can't, government can't rifle through your papers, government can't seize you and arrest you in jail without any, anything. It was about trespass. And because the phone lines were owned by uh, the, the phone company, putting wiretaps on wires on public streets and public thoroughfares, no, no trespass, no problem. You think that's the right, does that a right call? Does that make sense? No. No, this is one of those great examples where the, where the Supreme Court gets it absolutely effing wrong. There are more dramatic circumstances. Japanese internment comes to mind, uh, affirming that. But um, this is one of those areas where the Supreme Court got it completely wrong. And Justice Brandeis, Louis Brandeis, anybody heard of Louis Brandeis? Yes, excellent. So we've got some good, good constitutional scholars in here. So Brandeis, one of his great and most famous dissents, where he talks about, no, 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 no. Supreme Court majority gets it completely wrong. The Fourth Amendment and the constitutional view of privacy is not about trespass. It's about personal autonomy. It's about the right, as Brandeis calls it, the right to be let alone. Where he says, and it's just worth the quote, actually, where he says basically that, um, let me just find the language here, yeah, that the framers of the Constitution, quote, sought to protect Americans in their beliefs, their thoughts, their emotions, and their sensations. They conferred, as against the government, the right to be let alone, the most comprehensive of rights, and the right most valued by civilized men. Non -gen you know, gender issues of 90 years ago, notwithstanding. So to Brandeis, it was not about trespass. It wasn't about, it was about personal autonomy. Brandeis saw that with the march of technology, this newfangled device called a telephone, it didn't matter whether the intrusion of somebody's privacy, the intrusion took place on public streets or whatever else, it was the, it was the, the, the result of it which was somebody's intimate conversations were invaded and their own personal liberty, the right to be let alone was invaded. That was the case. You had a reasonable expectation that those conversations were private. Because of that, government should get a warrant. So, but he was in dissent. <clears throat> but his view carried the day, ultimately, 40 years later, in a case called, constitutional scholars among you? Katz versus United States. So Katz versus United States, anybody know the facts of Katz versus US? Katz involved a phone call out of a public telephone booth. So another great newfangled invention. Probably many of you in this room have never stepped foot in a public telephone booth. <laughs> But it used to be, you know, Superman actually used to change there. Now he's got to go someplace else. He's got to, he can't change in a cell phone or an iPhone. So Superman's got to go someplace else. But it used to be that you made phone calls in a public telephone, especially if you were a criminal. So he w this guy uh, made a phone call out of a public telephone booth. But of course, the FBI, thinking about Olmstead, thought, well, we can just tap the phone lines coming out of the public telephone booth. It's, again, if trespass is the, is the model here, well, let's just tap the lines. 
By this point, though, the court had gone, had sort of figured it out. It figured out that Brandeis was right. And in the famous words of the Katz majority, said that the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. So again, so here, it's about personal autonomy. It's not about trespass. No matter the technology and how the technology moves, it's about people, not places. And so Katz begins, the, uh, says basically, for any wiretapping, except national security context, come take my class in, at the law school if you want to know about the exceptions to this. But in criminal investigative purposes, government has to get a warrant before they wiretap your phone. Now, and a year later, Congress responded with, I have to say it, Title III of the Omnibus Crime Control Act in 1968. So if you ever watch any cop shows, The Wire, whatever else, people refer to it as a wiretap. That's the lingo of law enforcement. A T3 is a wiretap because it's from Title III of the Omnibus Crime Control Act in 1968. So now, fast forward about, I guess, nine years. There's a case called U.S. versus Miller, which tries to figure out this issue in a different context which is what happens if you're under investigation and the government wants to say, go to your bank and see what you've spent your money on? Can they just ask the bank? Well, what's, he, what's in his bank account? What's he, what's he spending his money on? And the court said, yeah, no problem there. You've voluntarily given that information to a third party. When you go to a bank and you open up a bank account or you open up a credit card account, and you do anything like that, you've voluntarily given your information to a third party. You have no reasonable expectation of privacy in that. Three years later, there was another case, a case called Smith versus Maryland, one of these great cases involving really stupid criminals. Because sometimes you get these really entertaining cases involving stupid criminals, and I've represented some of them in my day. Um, Smith versus Maryland involved a guy who brutally robbed, or mugged a woman, then started crank phone calls to her afterwards to sort of rub it in, what he had done. The great thing about it is that law enforcement figured this out. I mean, the woman figured out that who, who, was, who was calling her, and so the law enforcement put in what they call a trap and trace device, or a pen register. And a pen register, unlike a wiretap, doesn't capture the content of the communications, but it captures the dial tones and the tones that are used to actually make the call. Uh, another word for this that was used a little bit later is something called telef telephony metadata. And I'll get to that in about a minute. So, but the Supreme Court in this context, a pen register case, followed U.S. versus Miller again and said, no, when you dial, when you get on your phone and you dial, you know, 1-800, whatever it is, you are communicating those numbers to the phone company or to Verizon, whoever it is, and they are placing your call for you. So you have voluntarily given up that information to a third party, and then nothing you can do about it. You're out of the Fourth Amendment land. You've voluntarily given up that information. That was the third party doctrine, which is an interesting rule, which might have made sense in the 1970s, where, yeah, a lot of I mean, people did still hide cash under your mattress, I suppose, and there weren't a lot of things you were doing in your life that give up you know, information to a third party. Congress responded to those, also those decisions in the Bank Secrecy Act and also the Pen Register Act, created some standards, not warrants, but when the government wants to get that information, they got to say, it's usually it's a subpoena saying, well, it's relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. <coughs> and there are other contexts, or the Electronic uh, Communications Privacy Act, which basically applied some of these principles to emails, uh, but this was, that act was enacted in the 1980s along with the Storm Communications Act. So those um, were not quite, um, you know, you think those were in the 1980s. Now, do you think things have changed since the 1970s or 80s in terms of what information you give voluntarily to third parties? GPS, like, like everything you do on these things? Uh, like online banking, which you also do on these things. I don't know about you. But you think about so many of the things that you do in your life involves giving up information to third parties. 
But these cases in the 1970s still had that sort of Olmstead-like formalism that said, well, no, the Fourth Amendment is about uh, trespass of your own personal, I mean, so, so in some ways the third party doctrine is very so much similar to Olmstead. It's basically saying, well, if you've voluntarily given up this information to a third party, well, it's no longer trespassed on you. So an uncomfortable thing, and that was revealed to be dramatically uncomfortable, I think, by Edward Snowden. Uh, and I don't know, we don't have to go, we can get into a debate about Edward Snowden as to whether he should come back for prosecution or whether he should continue to enjoy the Moscow winter, yes. Yeah. So does that complicate that, or is that sort of mechanism that we use to compel surveillance seizures? It doesn't complicate it legally, I think, from the perspective of the third party doctrine, but I'll get into encryption in a moment, because it's hugely important, I think, from the modern view of how we look at these legal principles, uh, which I personally had to deal with when I was in Homeland, also in dealing with the FBI as well, because the FBI, this is the issue of encryption, law enforcement, the concern about what the FBI terms going dark where if you have point-to-point -point communications that are encrypted or data at rest that is encrypted or something like that, the question is whether the FBI, uh, in enforcing a warrant um, to intercept those communications, should be essentially allowed back the key to get in to decrypt the communication. Interesting Wild West legal issue, tough legal issue, which I'll get to in a, in a bit more in a sec. But okay, so now we get to Snowden. And Snowden reveals this program that was actually, for the most part, entirely legal. This was not Bush's warrantless wiretapping. This was an act of Congress, or the Patriot Act Plus as amended uh, in 2008, where the Bush and the Obama administrations went to the FISA court and got essentially an order authorizing collection of telephone metadata on the theory that you wanted to have this sort of de reservoir of metadata that could be compared to known suspect numbers. And so you could actually draw links and do link analysis to see who somebody, let's say al-Baghdadi and ISIS, picks up a call to um, you know, my dry cleaner, and then my dry cleaner calls me, and then I call the person who shines my shoes or like that, then we arrest the shoe shiner. No, something like that. But that's, I mean, that's the sort of the analysis. They want to find sort of the linkages to potentially suspect numbers using telephone metadata. So this is not content of communications. This is telephone metadata. Now, under the third party doctrine, this shouldn't be a problem. Because you're voluntarily giving up that metadata to third parties, i.e. Verizon or whoever else. And it's also, of course, then separate and apart, there's it's all under judicial supervision. But of course, it made a lot of people uncomfortable to know that this was happening, including members of Congress, who basically passed legislation ultimately by 2015 after there was lit litigation over this issue that basically killed the program. But it showed that this formalism of the Fourth Amendment in terms of how we draw the balance between security and privacy was a little bit out of whack. And so then you started seeing a series of cases uh, culminating in a case just a, about a month or two ago uh, where the court was struggling over this doctrine. One, there was a case called Riley, which is not really the third party doctrine, but basically said, these things contain your whole life, right? This isn't like a flip phone, this isn't like your wallet. These cell phone, these smartphones contain essentially all the details of your life. So when law enforcement picks up one of these things in the context of an arrest, then wants to go through it all and figure out what's on the thing, Supreme Court said in a case called Riley versus California, you got to get an additional warrant to go into this because this is this gets you into a, such a private area. Back to the Brandeis view of personal autonomy. Then there was a series of there's a case called U.S. versus Jones, great case, one of the most artful punts in all of Supreme Court history. This was the case where um, law enforcement in D.C. had attached a GPS tracker to somebody's car to find his movements through D.C. And it had been litigated through the courts, and the D.C. Circuit stepped right below the Supreme Court, basically said, gee, this is kind of, you know, I guess it's the third party doctrine and all that. Uh, at some point, this kind of persistent surveillance, even on public streets, 
starts to invade somebody's privacy, but we don't know at what point that is. I don't know what you do with that. Goes up to the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia, God bless him, said, punted, the great artful punt and said, well, the GPS tracker was attached to the car. So the, what is that? Trespass. So back to Chief Justice Taft, back to that view of the Fourth Amendment. We don't have to worry about personal autonomy and all that. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. We just know that there was a trespass. Yes. <laughs> and so the one of the great artful things in all of Supreme Court history by Justice Scalia, God bless him. Um, but that could only last so long. That punt could only last. So a couple months ago, there was a case called Carpenter versus U.S. Similar case, not involving GPS tracking, but involving cell, cell site, uh, cell site um, location data, which can be almost as accurate as GPS tracking, uh, especially in urban areas where there's lots of cell sites, uh, cell towers. And so um, in that case, uh, law enforcement had gone to um, Metro PCS, as well as I believe Sprint, and asked for location, cell site location data on a particular suspect or a series of suspects uh, that were involved, uh, potentially involved in a robbery of a Radio Shack and, wait for it, a T-Mobile, uh, a, a T-Mobile store. <laughs> great, one of the great ironies of Supreme Court history. So, um, to ask for that data. And the court struggled with it, and it's a 5-4 decision uh, authored by Chief Justice Roberts. So this is one of those issues that confound the liberal versus conservative lines. So it was Chief Justice Roberts siding with liberals, basically. In this case, saying, we're going to start rethinking the third party doctrine. We're the, this whole re third party doctrine that was come up in the 70s, it starts to feel really uncomfortable with, when you start thinking about the technology, the capabilities of modern technology for surveillance and what it can do to have that kind of of everything you do and it's it, and all that information is now held by third parties whether it be Verizon or Sprint or Wells Fargo Bank or whatever else so we got to start getting a handle on this and this was actually previewed by Justice Sotomayor one of the liberals uh, in one of in her concurrence in the US versus Jones case the GPS case the artful punt from by Scalia she actually in her concurrence said Come on, you know, this was a punt. You got to actually think about the real issue here. And what she says is basically, yeah, this case is about a GPS tracker put on the back of a car. But what this case is really about is these things in terms of what the government can do to ask Verizon what's on these things and who are you communicating with and what, what sites do you go on and Google and whatever else. So, um, Roberts finally took up the challenge, and now we're in a whole new era where I think the balance between security and privacy has been altered. And we don't know where it's going to go from here because what Roberts said was, we're going to go this far. We're going to say you need a warrant to get historical cell phone data uh, of the extent that you want, but we're not sure where else this new rule is going to apply. But you damn well better expect there's going to be litigation for the next 10 years trying to figure out where that line is. And the reason I go through this, most of you are technologists, and this is a different sort of world for you, talking about law, but it's really to illustrate these balances in terms of how do you, what's the right balance? I mean, there was, when I was a kid, there was this great show called The Constitution, That Delicate Balance. It was probably one of those things that led me to become a lawyer. Uh, it was this great seminar show talking about um, the Constitution. I watched, I was riveted to it when I was 13 years old. And yes, I was a nerd when I was 13 years old. I still am. Um, but it was really about that. It's, and, it, and it's really, when you think about all these issues, and especially technology, technology is the apple of discord in the law. Um, and we, and lawyers, we get it wrong <laughs> a lot, uh, you know, lawyers and judges. But now we're in a new era, and the Supreme Court has taken us in a new era now to really think through a few things. What's the right balance between, between security and privacy and consumer demand uh, and economic uh, um, business models. But it's also, I think, just as important is figuring out what is that line between private and public? That's the other crucial thing here is that that's the thing that Olmstead, back to Chief Justice, the debate between Taft and Brandeis, 
got into well, what's private and what's public and does it matter? That's the most important thing. Does it matter? Taft said it did matter because it's not a trespass into your home, so it's not private. Brandeis said, for lack of a better expression, bullshit. This is about personal autonomy. This is about who we are as individuals and our own civil liberties. Uh, and our fundamentally, as Brandeis said, our right to be let alone. And that's, I think I may be kind of out of time. I want to leave it to some questions. I think we've got 10 minutes. So I'll leave it to some questions. But I'll stop there. It leaves a lot of questions for you, but yeah. Yeah, so that, that sort of conti continues the conversation on encryption. It's a really interesting issue. This is one of those areas where we in the Department of Homeland Security followed uh, Justice Scalia's lead uh, and punted on the issue. Um, when we were, at least when we were in Obama, we let the FBI take the lead in sort of thinking through those issues while we sort of hid in the background. The problem was, I mean, Homeland actually, I mean, there's a reason for that, because the Homeland actually has, we have two missions. One is, of course, we have a law enforcement mission that's like the FBI's mission. But perhaps the, mo the more important mission that Homeland has is a security mission. Uh, and the theory that if you start breaking encryption, I mean, there's, I've heard it described as like you know, breaking a, a windshield, you know, the cracks that would go through in terms of making a broader network vulnerable to cyber hacks. And so we were speaking with forked tongue and Homeland on this issue. I think it's actually, it's a really difficult issue legally because one could say that if you actually have a judicially executed warrant, a, a, a warrant that's been issued by a judge based on probable cause, but a company like Apple, let's say Apple or Verizon, um, says, you know, even under the new Chief Justice Roberts world where you got to get a warrant to get third party information, and Apple says, all right, there may be probable cause of a crime or that somebody is a foreign agent. Uh, and all right, you got a judge that's actually issued order, a court order, saying you got to produce this information. You're going to say, in legally cognizable terms, nanny nanny boo boo, because we've encrypted all these communications and we don't have the key. The, our consumers have the key. Uh, I think that will last. Uh, a, I think obviously what happened in something like I think the San Bernardino case, the FBI figured out a way of hacking into the phone. So actually, some of these issues addressed by the cat and mouse game of law enforcement and the private sector in terms of hacking. But when you start getting into things like quantum encryption and things like that, it's going to be harder to think that way. I think I look at it politically also. Is if I think the concern I would have, I mean, I, I am concerned certainly about the um, privacy of communications. I think Snowden and the things that came out of that, I think, I think, put a premium, I think, in the technology community of allowing people to keep their privacy much more because I think of the concern about government's overreach here and surveillance. But I think with the Supreme Court wading into the issue of requiring warrants for third party data, it adds a bit more protection, uh, I think legal protection for that information even if it's encrypted. And the flip side of it, I think, politically is circumstance where there were communications that were relevant to an attack, say, that actually happened, and it was revealed that the communications existed and they were encrypted, and the FBI tried to get them to prevent an attack, I think politically that would be very dangerous, I think, for the technology community, uh, for the country. Because I think if there's anything I can see about Congress is that it overreacts to things <laughs> uh, in very damaging and dangerous ways. And so, so I guess the question I would have on that is, in light of the Supreme Court's new direction, on the third party doctrine and requiring warrants for third party data, maybe, depending on how you read Carpenter. Um, I think it's worth having another conversation about that issue uh, in the sense of whether there's additional protections now um, for people such that we could start thinking about, is there a clever way around um, the encryption issue that doesn't break encryption? Because that's the other, the other crucial thing, back to my cybersecurity priority. I want to I wanna undermine cybersecurity, yeah. <laughs>
sure. It's like John Wayne Gacy's town run by Yeah. And I wouldn't have cared if it was from the forties or whatever. It's just it's just a fascinating thing. And that's the argument I think that's the argument that's been made <coughs> by the privacy community is to say, you know, this whole encryption debate is a red herring because we're in what they call the golden age of surveillance. And it's because of the uh, internet of things and you say all these other things we can still track what you're doing. The counter argument to that that lawyers would say and the prosecutors would say is that there's something specific about communications um, in terms of intercepted communications because they offer admissions uh, and statements that can be convincing to a jury um, fundamentally. So I don't think it, I think it's, it dodges the question. I think we still need to answer the question of, under it's a punt, it's a punt. It's an, it's an important punt. A, on the Internet of Things uh, and all those things you say, thank God for Chief Justice Roberts uh, starting to really rethink the third party doctrine. Because it, I would not want to live in a world much longer. Actually, well, I don't want to still live for a long time, but I wouldn't want to live in a, world, in a world much longer where government can get whatever information it wants just because it's relevant to a criminal investigation just by going to a third party that we all deal with. Yes. Um, there's a great, I think it's W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, long, you know, anybody know who W.E.B. Du Bois is or was? Yes. Yeah, great. Sociologist and civil rights leader from 100 years ago. He had this great talk, I think, on the an anniversary of the John Brown uh, attack on Harper's Ferry. He talked about the about martyrs is if they're going to set themselves up to be a martyr, and so John Brown was hanged for the attack on Harbor's Ferry, trying to free the slave. Uh, and Du Bois said, if you're going to be a martyr, whether you're Jesus, whether you're John Brown or Edward Snowden, the key thing about the martyrs is that they get punished. They, that they actually do fundamentally, they, they, if they're going to do something like this, they've got to accept the reality that they're going to face legal consequences for what they do. And so my view on Snowden is sort of along the lines of what Du Bois said about John Brown, which is to say, I'm glad he did it from the perspective of, I'm glad the, the American public knows about the metadata collection as well as PRISM and the other things that we did. In the same way that, anybody read um, the David Sanger, the new David Sanger book, Perfect Weapon? Yeah, so about the reporters, I mean the first part of the book where, they, where Sanger and the other reporters broke the story of Stuxnet uh, and the cyber attack uh, that we did on the Iranian nuclear program, which, you know, a lot of people in the government were pretty pissed off about because it revealed sort of stuff that we had done. On the other hand, it's good that we know about the cyber weapons that are out there. Um, and I think with Snowden, it's good that we have that information. It's good that we know what happened. And Congress took action. Obama personally took action. The courts took action. But at the end of the day, he violated the law, and I think he should be prosecuted. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's another one of those issues. Um, <coughs> you know, it's. I mean, as I teach in my law school class, it's like, um, are are you happy with cameras on your streets? Um, you know, like in London or in Lower Manhattan after 9/11. Yes, it depends. If there's a camera like on literally every single you know, that, that persistently surveils you wherever you go, then you start getting into Chief Justice Roberts' territory of saying, at some point this becomes too much. And I think the wonder, the question with drones would be, um, I think if it's just like cameras on a street, I'm okay. If it's like if there are drones like everywhere, like mosquitoes, they're monitoring our every move. Uh, I think you start thinking you need to get a warrant for that um, to really sort of think that through. Um, the other thing about drones, I mean, separate apart from drones, I mean, I was certainly in the meetings in the White House when we were talking about the rules on uh, allowing for the use of drones for commercial and personal purposes, security issues with that. Whether you also, I mean, really interesting little known story, not very well reported story, was the assassination attempt of Venezuelan President Maduro using a drone with explosives on it. That's exactly what we were worried about. So, w hmm? Weaponized. Weaponized drones. So that's that's another other interesting issue with drones. Okay. Yes.
truthiness. Yeah, that's like that scene in Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man movie, where um, where he he where Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, before he's Spider-Man, doesn't intercept the person who's robbed somebody. He says, "Not my problem," and then, actually, it is his problem because you're Spider-Man. But the problem is, I think the common sense is it's like the movie Rashomon. I mean, it's common sense is depending on the perspective of the the censor, in some sense, and that's that's the problem. So I think. The issue, the first issue you raise with regard to the selling of personal data, um, yeah, common sense is on, it's on both sides of that issue because you could say, yeah, I think, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, common sense should be the default is privacy and that's what the European Union has done through its GDPR rule, which is to say lots of twists and turns of that, but it's basically an opt-in. You have to opt-in to allow for the sale of your data. California has, it's probably the strangest, strangest uh, the, the, the strictest rule here in the United States, but that's still an opt out. You're just given the opportunity to opt out in California when that goes into effect in November, I believe. Um, but I mean, the other common sense is from the perspective of the Facebook shareholders who lost a whole bunch of money uh, a couple weeks ago when they suddenly realized, well, perhaps Facebook's data model isn't gonna survive the Russians' fake news and our kind of more sensitive view, our common sense on privacy. So that's an interesting question in terms of, you know, whose common sense rules, but it's, uh, it raises a good point. Well, I think I'm getting the hook, yeah. We, we really yeah, okay, but all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.